Um, so here is some Spark code. Now, my assumption I'm going to make is that uh, most of you guys have heard about Spark. You have some familiarity with Spark. Um, I mean, most of my talk doesn't really get into like uh, you know conceptual understand you know details of Spark, um, but, but hopefully you'll be able to follow through here. Um, so what what I'm showing here is just uh, clips of the Spark streaming program um, where you're essentially you know it's it's very straightforward. Right? Uh, in, in Spark, you start the streaming context uh, and and uh, from the streaming context, I mean you you start to read from Kafka typically in parallel, uh, and then once you read start reading from Kafka, what emerges essentially is what's called a D-stream. Uh, which is nothing but in Spark. Um, I think the key distinction, if you're if you're not aware, is that um, when streams are processed, they're always processed as micro batches, right? You never do one event at a time processing in Spark. So in some sense, Spark's design center is geared for high throughput, uh, but with a predictable latency, right? So that uh, if I can say that, hey, listen, I want to process something once every two seconds, derive some insight, take some action, it's possible to do with Spark streaming, but you cannot do something where you, you need to take an action within a millisecond. So, you know, that's that's not what we are also after. We are really focused on sort of this one, two second batch, uh, batch intervals. So what I'm doing here is it's basically saying, let's stream micro batches in parallel from Kafka to a bunch of Spark executors. And the first thing you're doing is sort of filtering out some events uh, for you know, events that belong to unknown geography. Let's take it out. Uh, so you run through a mapper, and the mapper is essentially now emitting key value pairs, right? So the key being the publisher geography kind of key, right? It's the publisher and the geography becomes a key. And then the rest of uh, the fields simply becomes a value. And the reason I do that is the very subsequent step, I want to do the reduction, right? And simply all, all we're doing is pre-aggregating, right? We're saying, hey, for every uh, publisher in geography for the certain uh, time window. So let me actually see if I can switch to the actual code here somewhere. Oh, maybe it's here. Um, so here is a real code, right? Um, so where, where I'm essentially doing a reduction of um, by, by every two seconds, I'm reducing by essentially by the publisher and geography and I'm computing essentially the impressions uniques and the sum sum price and then you essentially land up saving it if you made to Cassandra or whatever else you're working with right so in this case I'm saving it to to Mongo so there are two interesting problems right the first is that the moment you do reduce in anything like spark for that matter any of the other products you, you run into a challenge um, because of the shuffle being involved, right? It shuffle becomes one of the most expensive things in Spark, and especially starts to show up in a real-time application, right? And and if your batch, even if your batch was rather large, um, and you let's say, I mean, here it's a very simple, it's a simple group by, uh, but if you have a group by with some joins going along, I mean, that's where it gets really expensive, and it's quite possible that you're no longer able to keep up with the stream that's coming at a high rate, right? So that becomes a thing, one, one challenge. The next challenge is, hey, listen, once I start to write my data, the process information to my store, that's yet again a shuffle inside the database cluster, right? So here's a little deeper look at this, these bottlenecks. And then the first thing is that uh, from a shuffle standpoint, touched on this aggregations, group by, map reduce, um, involves shuffles. Shuffles go through stages in inside of Spark. A stage has to fully finish before the next stage begins, causes a lot of trouble, right? Um, and the same thing if you're doing like joins and stuff like that inside of Spark um, with other streams, or for that matter, historical streams and reference data, it becomes very expensive. The third thing where shuffle costs are introduced is when you're essentially writing to a data store and you're now learned the data store itself has to now replicate itself to protect the data that becomes expensive. Then on top of that, you know, what is very notorious is really the cost associated with copying and serialization in such systems, right? The first is that, you know, hey, Spark has a certain kind of data model. Maybe you're working with RDDs, with flat objects, maybe you're working with data frames uh, that, that have a certain way of formatting, especially if you're caching inside of Spark, it has a certain way to format the data. Right now, when you write it out to essentially a fast data store, their data models are different. So if you look at Cassandra, it 
or an H base or Redis, all these things are row oriented stores. Uh, so they land up essentially managing data in a certain kind of way which also requires them to shuffle data around, but more importantly, also requires them to copy, serialize, deserialize in different formats. So all of this, right, the data flowing through many processes, the data model changes, and perhaps the most not so looked up, looked into is this in JVM copying that happens in these modern systems. I mean, it's just completely outrageous, right? So here is, here is a simple example of what, what you would see in terms of copying if you're really writing essentially a chunk of data that you're ingesting to say over the network to one primary store i mean primary sort of partition and the primary partition is replicating so what you'll land up saying is oh guess what there's a network buffer copy then it goes into the kernel the kernel makes a copy into the user space which typically is the java young generation heap then you might land up in the from in the two space and if that if that little object is long lived in our case it is it'll then actually land up getting copied into the old generation space. And guess what, after that, that, that JVM and that process has to say, well, I need to replicate this to other, some other guy. So typically you land up holding a lock, make a kernel copy, go back into the network buffer, and then literally repeat all these steps on the replica, and then an act is getting processed, right? So if you think about it, that's probably about 15 copies in a system that is considered pretty efficient, right? I'm not even considered the fact that there are more copies involved if you're writing to disk. And then if, you, if your backend storage layer is something like HDFS, by default HDFS does three replica, replicas. You're looking at maybe 20 copies of the same piece of data that's happening just when you do a single write, right? So pretty darn expensive. So the question really becomes, right, is there a way we can really localize processing and really you know, avoid all this copying, right? So, so can we localize processing with state, avoid the shuffling, right? Um, can, can something like Kafka, uh, Spark partitions, and the data store essentially share the same, um, you know, partitioning policy, right? So if, if they could all share the same partitioning policy, then, you know, it minimize shuffling, and the idea is that, hey, then, then it'd go much faster. So can you embed? So, so there are several options, obviously, even today, right? With Spark itself, you can essentially manage, you know, now they have a, this notion that says map with states. So you can have this fairly simplistic, you know, key value cache paradigm inside of Spark. Um, or you could, you know, how about like Apache, Sams, or Flink, they all essentially support some way of essentially managing state inside the stream processing layer. But the question really is, the good scalable key value stores, but is this really good enough, right? So here's a key challenge, right? And I think the more we look, the more we find that it's not enough for these end applications to say, yeah, I'm just gonna give you a key, right? Give me my value, give me my aggregated answer back. I mean, yes, those are very simplistic apps, but most often what we're running into nowadays is that these, these apps are potentially something running on a Tableau, something running on a click view, uh, and they want to visualize their, their result. And the visualization typically involves running some analytical class queries. So as an example, in our example, you might be looking and saying, hey, can I find the total uniques for a certain ad grouped on geography? Can I do impression trending for advertisers? Can I be looking for outliers, for instance, on the bidding price? And that's that's one of those interesting problems, right? Key value stores are row oriented in nature and they're not really suited well for scanning, if you're trying to do aggregations, uh, distributed joints, what have you. Uh, and the reason they are not good is something I'm cover in the very next slide. Uh, but on top of that, uh, what you land up finding is that the memory utilization of key value stores, especially if they are sort of in quote unquote in memory, is in fact poor. Uh, and and the reason it's poor is because for every key value pair, they have to have a way by which, um, given a request, they can access that key value pair in its entirety very very quickly, right? So it's typically baggage along with that goes along with every little key value pair inside a you know inside such systems.